Water is the very source of life and throughout human history we have always settled close to where we can find it. Some of the world's oldest cities are found next to the sea or by a river like India's most ancient city Varanasi. This week, CNA correspondent dives deep into this intimate relationship we have with water and the constant struggle to make sure that we have enough of this very resource that sustains us. A goddess, mother, the cradle of the most magnificent empires India has ever seen. These are only some of the adjectives used to describe the Ganges, or as it's called here, the river Ganga. Along with its tributaries, it still supports 450 million people. For many more in the country, the Ganga is more than a source of water. Right from the birth of a child, to marriage, even initiation, or even till death, you know, rivers are connected to your rituals. Hindu scriptures mandate 16 rites of passage. Many are carried out on a river bank, from the first haircut of a child to the cremation of someone who's died. Rivers are actually uh, conferred as some kind of a benediction. A benediction which is there forever and always. The Ganga and its largest tributary, the Yamuna, originate in the Himalayas. In northern India, they form the country's most fertile river basin, the Ganga Yamuna Doab, the land between two rivers. It's here that kings of Hindu mythology, as well as the mighty Mughal emperors, established their capital. When the Yamuna enters Delhi, it is a pristine river. The water is fit for bathing and this riverbank can support aquatic life as well. But just a short 20 kilometer stretch through Delhi adds 75% of all the pollutants in the Yamuna. Ganesh Pandit's family has lived here for five decades. Feudal lords gave them this land to work here as priests and boatmen. And it pains Ganesh that the Yamuna is a pale shadow of its glorious past. For Ganesh, the Yamuna is incorruptible. He regularly bathes and boats in the river even during peak pollution season. As the monsoon gives way to dry winters, these iceberg-like toxic foam structures begin appearing. They are caused by dangerously high levels of phosphates in the water, a common pollutant found in sewage from residential areas. This is one of the 22 drains that carry sewage from in and around Delhi to Yamuna. Experts say these are the biggest source of pollutants for the river. This is the same river which serves the needs of three quarters of New Delhi's nearly 20 million people. The government has set up 41 sewage treatment plants to clean the river, but some are either in disrepair or simply too technologically outdated to handle a heavy load. The treatment plant behind me isn't functional, so this water is untreated. As you can see, it looks very polluted and the stench too is almost unbearable. I am collecting a test sample for Chirashri Ghosh. She's a professor of environmental sciences and specializes in river rehabilitation. Can this water really be used for any daily activities? For human consumption, totally no. For public, uh, also the personal use, no, definitely. For washing of cars and other things, maybe. 
This sample contains high levels of toxic metals like iron and arsenic, and when tested for acidity, the results are off the charts. It's a warning sign for anyone consuming this water directly or indirectly. Part of the pollutants is industrial waste, untreated toxic runoff released from factories. And it's made worse by the population burden on these waters with too many people extracting too much water. It must have certain minimum ecological flow. If Yamuna doesn't have that flow, this river can never be cleaned. A lot of the water is being extracted for agricultural use. Agricultural fields like these use up nearly two-thirds of the water in India's rivers, reducing the river's flow and damaging its self-cleaning mechanism. The fertilizer and chemicals used also percolate deep under the groundwater. It gets carried through the porous soil into the rivers nearby, polluting it even further. But not too far from here, a community is giving river activists hope. Millions of pilgrims flock to the town of Gokul every year to worship the Hindu god Krishna and the river Jamuna, Krishna's mythical wife. This section of the river was thought to be unsalvageable. Due to petrochemical waste from a refinery nearby, the water of the river used to appear black and dead fishes would float right on the surface. But the community here has been able to bring back a healthy riverside ecosystem through multiple petitions and intervention of the local courts. For years, volunteers of the Rivers of the World organization have been showing up every day for a cleanup. It's one of hundreds of small NGOs on a crusade to clean India's sacred rivers. Now, these activists want to go beyond community engagement and implement high-tech solutions. We have given the solution and we are not asking any money. You do it, we will help. Their solution includes creating wetlands that can naturally separate waste from water through a sedimentation process. While the system can't clean large stretches like the ones in Delhi, they are proven to work in small patches. Spot cleanups and sewage treatment are short-term solutions. Experts believe freeing up the water off the river will enable it to self-clean in the long run. But that would mean reducing water usage across the board. Some are proposing a multi-state water sharing agreement that caps the amount of water that can be drawn for agriculture and industries. Other, more maverick suggestions include redesigning urban infrastructure so cities can only use the part of the river that flows through them. That will force them to clean that water before they can use it. This would be the near ideal situation for both Ganga and Yamuna. The section of river behind me has low levels of water pollution and a variety of freshwater fishes and the occasional migratory birds. It's a tall order. It requires strong political will and widespread awareness. But experts say that it's a task that can be achieved for India's sacred rivers. The Philippines is an archipelago made up of more than 7,600 islands. We are surrounded by water, yet many communities still do not have access to clean and potable water. I'll explain why when CNA Correspondent returns. Ashley Adele is only 23 but already has three children with another one on the way. The first thing that she sees when she leaves the group of shanties she calls home is the vast expanse of water in Manila Bay. The sight of water is almost a taunt at her when her family has no direct access to water, both for drinking and bathing at home. Tapos malayo pa po yung inigiba namin, doon pa po sa baker eh. Sawa ko po nagbubuhat. Ashley takes me to their home to show how difficult their conditions are. The alleys on the way are too narrow. When we get inside, I realize that they don't have a toilet or a bathroom. She tells me they urinate on the floor adjacent to where they sleep. Other toilet waste goes into a plastic bag that only gets collected when the garbage truck comes along every day. Gusto ko naman pong pakabit ng tubig, kaso wala pong 
pera pang down. Sila po kasi mekaniko yung trabaho ng asawa niya. Kaya po may tubig sila mo. Yung trabaho lang po kasi ng asawa ko, said ka. Ashley supplements the family income by peeling garlics for a middleman who sells these to restaurants. About an hour from here is Eastern Metro Manila, which also suffered a water crisis back in 2019. For days, piped water supply was cut for up to 20 hours a day, affecting even middle to higher income households. Because of rapid urbanization, demand finally outpaced supply. That demand was driven to a larger extent by commercial and industrial rather than household use. Affected gravely are agricultural areas in need of irrigation, critical to the country's food security. The irony is that an archipelago like the Philippines is surrounded by water. And one challenge is how to harvest and store water for use. I travel to the site of the proposed Kaliwa Dam, touted by the government as a solution to Metro Manila's water supply woes. We're here at the Agas River, where two major rivers near the Philippines' eastern coast intersect. One of them is the Kaliwa River, which flows from the Kaliwa watershed. When watersheds are denuded, rivers downstream, like this one, tend to overflow during intense rains, affecting riverside communities like the one behind me. The Kaliwa watershed is a protected area by law, able to catch rainwater to prevent floods and the overflow of water systems downstream. That's why many are opposed to the dam which would be built on the watershed. I visit one of the tribal communities living close to the watershed. As the crow flies, it is just 30 kilometers from Manila, but it will take me longer to reach my road. We left Manila at dawn, and yet we still haven't reached the tribal community of the Dumagat Remontados here in General Nacar Town in Quezon Province. Now, to get there, you need to cross this tributary, which is one of many tributaries from the Kaliwa River, which benefits from the Kaliwa watershed. After five hours on the highway from Manila, another hour uphill, multiple bodies of water crossed, and a 20-minute climb, I finally reach the hut of tribal leader Conchita Calzado. We are now in the mountains right on the east coast of northern Philippines, which shield the main island of Luzon from strong typhoons. The community is among Luzon's first line of defense against storm surges, witnessing the huge rise in sea water levels that happen during these typhoons. Kung ngayon nga ay yung dito sa amin na sa Baybay Dagat, yung hindi narating ng ilang dekada ng alon, ngayon ay lampas na ng dekada. At ang mga ilog, ang mga iniinuman naming mga tubig ay natutuyo na kapag panahon ng tagaraw. Ano pa kaya kung sisirain pa yung ilang ektare ang lupa na makakadagtag? Ang gubat ay siya naming parang buhay na rin at dyan umiiral yung aming kultura. Dyan ang aming paaralan, dyan ang aming kabuhayan, at dyan ay at sisirain ito ng project. Business and civil society are also pushing for greater transparency over proposed water sources. Right next to Kaliwa Dam, there are several other options that can be used that may or may not have um, the same adverse impacts uh, as we've seen with the, with the Kaliwa Dam. The Philippines is spread over 7,000 islands, making cost, distance, and long-term quality of pipes major obstacles to potable water access in the country. A sustainable solution should adapt to the country's maritime geography. A local firm is partnering with governments to deploy solar-powered desalination stations to communities in need. You can actually take 
all of the components that you need for your systems and transport them by small boat or by banca down to the island and literally hand assemble them uh, in, a ma- in a matter of hours to start running. Water treatment solutions like this could benefit Conchita's Domagat Remontados community, which is off both the water treatment and power distribution grid because of its secluded location. They rely instead on a small reservoir they built from which water, both for drinking and sanitation, can flow from further upland. My trip and interactions with communities on the ground forced me to reflect on how difficult it can be for people in the margins of society to access for daily use our planet's most abundant resource. While it flows freely in the wild, water for human consumption is still out of reach for many. The U.S. may be one of the richest countries in the world, but it's finding that water is a commodity money can't buy. Water is a precious commodity in California and for much more than just drinking. It sustains the state's 50 billion US dollar agriculture industry and the livelihoods of those who work in it. It provides a habitat for wildlife and electricity to power the world's fifth largest economy. 38% of America's jobs now are coming out of the state of California, 38%. But California and all the Western United States are in the midst of a record-breaking drought. These last two years in California are the driest two years on record. The state's lakes are depleted, its forests scorched by wildfires, its rivers drying up. Here at this reservoir near Sacramento, the situation is growing increasingly dire. The water levels at Folsom Lake are quickly approaching their lowest levels in history. I'm standing on what would usually be the bottom of the lake, submerged under 30 meters of water. These floating docks would be full of boats. The lack of rain, and also less snow in the nearby Sierra Nevada mountains, means the reservoir is running dry. Well, we rely on the Sierra Nevada for our water. It comes down through both the uh, the north and the south fork of the American River, which feed this lake. Um, So we rely on that snow runoff. I hate seeing it like this, and it this seems to be becoming our, our new norm. Extremes like droughts, floods, and fires have always been a part of life in the western U.S. But a changing climate is presenting new challenges. Climate change is making those extremes worse. Uh, what we expect as climate change continues to worsen, we expect more extremes, more long periods of drought, more severe flooding. California farms are on the front lines of the crisis. Farms here produce more food than any other U.S. state, and they use about 80 percent of California's water delivered through a complex network of reservoirs and aqueducts. But because of the drought, they have had to make do with less. So normally in the Sacramento Valley here, we flood about uh, 100,000 hectares uh, for for rice straw decomposition, and also for uh, the birds and waterfowl. And this year, that number is going to be more like 27,000 hectare. When water becomes scarce, and if they're able to, farms are often forced to tap into groundwater wells, which are expensive to run. So this year, many farmers in this area transferred their water rights to other, more desperate farms, with the state effectively paying them not to use water. In my district here, about 40% of the rice did not get planted because it was, the water was transferred. The California Department of Water Resources plays an important role in managing the state's water supply. The cycles brought on by climate change are testing that system like never before. We've had one of the wettest years on record in 2017 and now 
some of the driest years on record uh, just a few years later. And so that variability is, is really starting to stress the infrastructure to the edge of its capacity. State regulators have warned that if the drought continues, local water agencies may not get any allocation of new water next year at all. For many farms, the impact would be devastating. We have to prepare for the worst. Those guys south of the Delta who relied on our transfers this past year are gonna be in a world of hurt. When California runs low on water, it doesn't just affect agriculture. This reservoir is extremely important both for California's water supply infrastructure as well as hydroelectricity generation. For the first time in its history, state officials shut down one of the hydroelectric power plants here because of record low water levels. In a typical year, hydropower would account for around 15% of California's overall electricity. That's plummeted as water flows continue to decrease. The amount of hydroelectric power that uh, we produced in 2020 was down uh, perhaps almost 50% from what we produced in 2017. This year, the federal government is predicting that the hydropower production will be half of what it was last year. So we're down to really a small fraction of what we've been able to utilize traditionally. And that's a big indicator of how much water we have to work with. And less hydropower means more reliance on gas-fired power plants. While renewables account for about a third of California's in-state electricity, wind and solar power often aren't accessible to California's grid when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And that grid has been severely overstretched at times lately, partly as a result of people using more air conditioning as the temperatures rise. I've saved 7,510.7 pounds of CO2 emissions, or the equivalent of planting 57 trees. Comes up and Proponents of home solar systems paired with battery storage see solutions on the horizon. The drought has reduced the output of all of the hydroelectric dams. The important point to make here, though, is if we continue to invest in solar, we can pretty easily uh, replace the capacity of our hydroelectric dams with distributed solar. There is hope, too, that better water management will help conserve this important resource for future generations. The focus right now is really on groundwater storage. We've got lots of uh, capacity within our groundwater basins throughout the state. And so moving water when it's available in the flood season, in winter when we do get it, and in wet years, to groundwater where we can store it and then get it back out when, when we get into our next drought. Competing interests and ideas have made long-term investment difficult. As water levels keep sinking and temperatures keep rising, the situation is growing more urgent by the day. Californians have been asked to voluntarily reduce water use. Soon, it may be mandatory. As the reality of the changing climate sinks in, the true cost of water is now surfacing for many in California.